so I'm so excited to be here this year. This is my first year here. Um, I am not that far away, about an hour drive in, um, I live in West Hartford, Connecticut. My practice is in Avon. So a little bit about my background. Um, I started out um, in a uh, Bachelor of Science program in nutritional biochemistry. And I thought I wanted to continue to pursue that. So I went to the University of Iowa and I was in a PhD program in biochemistry there. But um, my interest started to change. So I realized one late night in the lab that I uh, didn't see my future 12 o'clock at night checking a chromatography column. And I, <laughs> I thought I would better serve um, by working directly with people. But Obviously, with my background, I knew the importance of nutrition, and so I did want to be in the healthcare realm um, and explored my opportunities, and naturopathic medicine was a perfect fit for me. So I went to um, Bastyr University, which is in Seattle, and, yep, you did too? Yay! <laughs> um, any more naturopaths here? We just got the two of us? OK. Uh, we're usually a small group, let me just say. And I, I do speak and educate healthcare providers around the country. And it's usually a pretty diverse group, but there's not a lot of NDs. So um, in the state of Connecticut and now in Massachusetts as well, it depends on the state you live in. Naturopathic doctors may not even have a license in your state. So in Connecticut, we work as specialists. We accept insurance. We can order diagnostic testing. Um, we just have a different um, view on health. So we, um, the core of what we do is bringing kind of the fundamentals into place. And so food as medicine is at the core of what naturopathic doctors um, uh, believe in their pillars of medicine. So um, in our practice, uh, we have a number of naturopathic physicians. My husband is a chiropractor and trained acupuncturist. And then we also have a gynecologist who specializes in integrative women's health. So but today, I want to talk to you about um, epigenetics. And so with my background in um, biochemistry and then learning the traditional naturopathic medicine, the two are actually a very good fit. So what the science that's emerging around epigenetics, which I'm going to explain further, um, really validates the traditional methods that naturopathic physicians have practiced for over 100 years, like why food, why herbs work so well. Um, and what is happening now is that there's a, um, what I would call a paradigm shift, and so the disease crisis in the United States, the healthcare crisis, and why I say disease crisis is because we're so focused on chronic disease and finding cures to diseases when we have the answers. And they're focusing on what promotes health. And now we're starting to see this sort of sea change in um, the scientific community where um, we're looking at genes that are related to resilience. And so what factors in our lifestyle actually affect you know, which genes get turned on and off, which I'll explain a little bit further. But basically, the, this paradigm shift is of, uh, we're, we're in the middle of it, um, very much at the leading edge of it, <laughs> middle, leading early middle. Um, and then I also want to talk about um, the specific components in our food that impact our genes and relate to some of these big um, di processes that are happening in disease and dysfunction, like oxidative stress and inflammation. So um, I ended up a couple of years ago writing a book called Unzip Your Genes. And it's found in the health section, not in a racy area of the bookstore. Uh, but basically, um, this, is, this is the premise that I wrote the book, um, basically helping us the, that the emerging science, um, that we're in the middle of this transformation in healthcare, and that the choices we make in our entire lifestyle, and I know we're focused on nutrition here, and I had a moment to uh, pop in at um, Ellen Palmer's talk a little uh, just before, and I know there were some questions about 
energy and emotion and spirit, and that does affect our DNA as well. I'll point that out a little bit, but as this is a soil and nutrition conference, we're very focused on nutrition, but those aspects are also very critical in um, DNA expression. So a little bit uh, about genomics. So in my clinical practice, we, I started using uh, what's called genomic testing a couple of years back. And basically, with, um, when we think about genomics, it's actually the study of um, analyzing and sequencing entire, uh, the entire genome. And that carries all of our DNA in a single cell. But studying that variability within it, which is what, uh, what, why we're unique, helps us to better um, tailor um, what we call a treatment plan or a health plan for a patient. And so in doing this, this is a whole system of medicine now um, categorized as precision medicine in healthcare. Now, when you hear a lot about precision medicine, if you hear it in the news, a lot of times they're talking about precision pharmaceuticals <laughs> and not necessarily precision health care. So again, it's back to that disease care. Um, but what we think about when we think about precision um, health care, true health care, is looking beyond disease and um, you know, catching things early when it's more of in a dysfunction state. Also, um, at... Um, Mount Sinai, there's actually a project that's been going on for a number of years now. I submitted DNA for this project, and it's a project um, where they're studying resilience genes. So you, I'm sure you know people in your life, and maybe you're one of them, <laughs> uh, but there are people who don't necessarily make great choices. All their choices are not great, yet they are lively and healthy and they're 95 and they're without <laughs> disease and so these people are what we can call resilient um, and so studying their DNA can help us to learn more about what um, kind of sets off a cascade of reactions or, or manifestations that lead to um, a dysfunctional metabolic state. Even more important, and this is what I'm going to talk about more in this uh, particular talk, is the concept of being able to turn on and off your genes. And so although we're born with a set DNA, a set code or book of life, how you live influences that way more than the genes you were given. So this is the power of nutrition. Um, when you... Every choice you make, mind, matter, how you move your body, this is affecting you on a deep level, at the level of your DNA. So sometimes you'll hear this concept of what's called a SNP, an SNP. And so these are the genes that we're talking about that get turned on and off. So this is something called a single nucleotide polymorphism. What this is, is a, just a single nucleotide chain in the gene. This is what makes us unique. So 99% of our genes are the same. And then that variability that results in the phenotype when you look around the room of how people are different, it's the spaces between um, genes that um, produces that variability. And that's those, those one nucleotide changes. Now, those changes can then also be affected by your lifestyle choices, and I'll get into that in a minute. So um, this is basically a summary of what I just said about there, there are these sections that code for a gene. Within those sections, that those, when, a, when a SNP occurs in those genes, that's usually when we see more serious health consequences. And the spaces between the genes is where you would see um, less of a health consequence. So these changes, these uh, not changes or variations, we don't like to call them mutations, although you'll, be, you'll hear about them called mutations. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of the MTHFR. That's probably the most um, commonly heard of SNP. And it'll often be referred to as a mutation, but really it's just variation in the gene. 
So when I'm thinking about using genetic testing, that we'll just do a saliva test and have an analysis of certain genes, depending on what we're trying to target, what that does for us in clinical practice is it removes some of this guesswork. It saves the patient time and money because um, we can figure things out more quickly, and it can help us um, formulate a more effective program. Now, what's interesting about genomic testing when we think about wellness, so if a patient comes to me and has um, a strong family history of heart disease, we can do a series of gene tests and look at whether they've inherited some of those genes that elevate their risk, because we don't know. The, you know. We just have a family risk, but now we can actually document objectively whether you've inherited some of those genes. Now, even if you have inherited those genes, you can turn them off. So it does not mean that now you're destined to go on and develop type 2 diabetes, to have early onset heart disease. What we find, and there are many different um, scientific studies that validate this, is that first of all, people who have had genomic testing and find out like there's something called the obesity gene. If you find out you have the obesity gene, and I routinely see this in my practice, and this person's sitting in front of me and they're not obese, first of all. So why is that? It's because they've probably worked hard at their lifestyle and they eat well, they exercise, they minimize uh, stress responses. Um, but when people find out that they have what's billed as the fat gene, there are multiple European studies showing that they end up being healthier as a result of that. So now they're like, uh-oh, I've got this gene, I better take care of myself, and they end up making better lifestyle choices. So this is powering what we call their epi epigenome. Um, this is a great example of where we use, where we start to tie together nutrition and genomics, genomic testing. And I'm going to stop talking about genomic testing in a minute, I promise. <laughs> um, but this is where we tie that nutrition together. So there's a um, particular SNP, a couple of these SNPs. The FTO is that fat gene that I've talked about. There's also one called MC4R. These SNPs also predispose to type 2 diabetes. Um, and so, no, so uh, this was a large-scale study, 7,000 subjects, so that's really big for a clinical study. Um, and this was published in a, a really well-recognized journal. And the patients, they put, basically put them on a Mediterranean diet. So that's um, characterized by a particular ratio of, of macronutrients, so a little bit higher fat, but those fats are going to come mostly from plant sources. Olive oil is key in the Mediterranean diet. And then, of course, there's a, um, a rich amount of phytonutrients coming in as well because now we're talking about legumes, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, all you know, dense in phytonutrients. And the people who followed the Mediterranean diet basically turned off that gene. So their risk goes away completely. So if I have patients who come in and they're pre-diabetic already, or they have a high risk family risk, then this is a type of test that I would think about using, and then recommending a Mediterranean diet as a result of that. So epigenetics. Um, this technically, uh, you know, the definition is a, a, a sort of a, a way to view it is just how the environment affects the genome. Um, so what happens is your DNA will get chemically transformed. So the DNA, this is how it can be actually measured. So science, uh, scientific studies will measure something called methylation as one of the primary um, chemical processes that basically marks the DNA or modifies it. And so depending on the cell type, and whether it's a normal cell or an abnormal cell, if it's a cancer cell, um, whether that particular cell is methylated, it can maybe hypermethylated or hypomethylated, then that has an effect of either turning that gene on or off. So something like a tumor suppressor gene, so this would be um, a gene that codes for cells 
that go around and patrol for cancer cells, like, and basically put them through apoptosis so they, then your body will kill those aberrant cells. If the gene is turned off for that, you have less control. Your body is not patrolling as well anymore. And that is inf affected by what, how you live. So green tea is a great example of that. Green tea turns on tumor suppressor cells, turns on the gene for them. Um, there are some other chemical processes you'll read about sometimes. Um, methylation is one of the primary ones, as I said. Acetylation and histone modification are also two other processes that um, result in DNA modification that would be in that category of epigenetics. Now, what's interesting about epigenetics, so this is happening in our bodies. Your offspring can inherit those marks. So we'll talk about this also. This can actually be passed on through successive generations. So epigenetic uh, changes are heritable as well. So there are a number of studies on things like the Holocaust, the Dutch famine, and people who have been through significant stressful physical stressors, mental stressors, that gets passed down. So you'll see there are articles written about this, and it's basically about heritable emotional trauma passed down through successive generations. Um, and we see that playing out even with physical symptoms. So originally, some of these landmark studies that came out prior to that, they were thinking um, offspring of survivors of the Holocaust had certain health outcomes. Um, that were poor compared to the rest of the population. And they thought it was just, you know, thinking about being a survivor of the Holocaust, you'd obviously have a lot of emotional trauma, and maybe that was that nature versus nurture piece. And so maybe the connection they made with their children as a result of that was attributable to higher rates of anxiety or heart disease even. Um, but it turns out it was more so genetic based that those marks on the DNA from that trauma is passed on to the offspring and now we have a nature issue instead of just purely nurture. Um, and we also, I haven't seen any studies on this, but I suspect that this is true of um, African Americans who have higher rates of hypertension and heart disease and diabetes. If you think about what has happened through successive generations, I think that that is probably one of the primary reasons that they have higher rates of um, these chronic disease outcomes. So just to summarize some of the things, stress I put way up there. I know, again, we're at a nutrition conference, but you can't um, underestimate the effect of what stress does to the body. And I see this all the time. I see patients who are eating right. They're eating good quality food. They're exercising. They are doing everything seemingly correct. They're getting enough sleep. They're avoiding chemicals. And how are they dealing with stress or what's happening in their life that makes a huge difference in their um, DNA? No, they're not. They're not ranked. I don't think I have not yet to find a ranking on that. So um, genetics, what, what you end up seeing, in, you know, when a clinician is seeing a patient, what we see in front of us, we have to recognize that that's a blend of genetics, some of this variability, but also lifestyle. So what their current health status is, what their past medical history is, what types of surgeries they've had, what types of trauma they've had in their life. But of course, then diet, exercise, sleep is also really critical. And by making these positive lifestyle changes, you can actually impact your phenotype, like what you're seeing in terms of your metabolic state. So now I'm going to focus more on nutrition. Um, and this uh, slide demonstrates how, you know, we know people should be eating. The recommendation is five to seven servings of fruits and vegetables. So here's a slide looking at vegetable intake. The green um, 
is how many people are meeting, not meeting that guideline. They're below the recommendation. So this is like scary statistics in my opinion. Um, <laughs> so you've got, it's um, divided into age groups and then male and female. I'm going to total on the bottom. So essentially what you see here to summarize it is that 90% of the UN population in the United States doesn't meet the recommended daily vegetable intake. You only got 10% of people actually eating five to seven servings of fruits and vegetables a day. Um, and then what is the quality, right? What's the quality of those foods that they're eating? So first of all, it's the, the challenge is getting people to actually eat those foods. So this is how bad it is out there. Okay, and then you have the challenge <laughs> of poor food quality. Here's another slide that looks um, a little deeper in there. So this is um, focusing on children aged 2 to 19, and this slide is vegetable intake. Um, and so any vegetable looks like, you know, basically everyone's getting some sort of vegetable. But what I want you to know is that the USDA includes french fries as vegetables. They inc include ketchup as vegetables. Uh, the um, juice is considered a fruit. So that's not on this slide. I'm going to show you fruit in a second. So now when you start to look in here a little deeper, dark green leafy vegetables. Okay, So now it doesn't look as good. You see that's that next slide right here, dark green leafy vegetables, or bro broccoli, all of our, our yummy greens are right here. Red and orange, so ketchup's gonna be in here though. Uh, <laughs> starchy, you got your french fries in here, or potatoes, carrots, um, and then this is just other. Um, then the issue with fruits, so, whoops. As you can see, you know, younger kids are eating fruits, and then you know, they start to become teenagers, and it starts to drop off. Um, fruit juice is actually on this slide. So over here, you see younger kids are drinking fruit juice, and then they stop drinking fruit juice, but what do they start drinking? Soda. And then um, citrus, melons, and berries are right here, packed with phytonutrients, but low intake. And then we got other fruits up here. So interestingly, as I said, 10% of the population is meeting guidelines for five to seven fruits and vegetables. Just increasing by one serving actually has a 5% reduction in risk of um, um, total all-cause mortality. So by just going up one vegetable, it actually does make a difference. So if you, as a clinician, take your patient from eating one serving of fruit to two, you've just gotten them 5% reduction in all-cause mortality. Like that's a, such a simple, simple intervention. Um, but it's interesting how, oops, it's interesting how this data kind of levels off at five. So I haven't looked exactly deep into this particular um, outcome, but it levels off at five. But I can't imagine. This is just all-cause mortality. We're not talking about morbidity here, and I think the statistics would look a lot different when it comes to morbidity um, because we know um, that, that concept, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the term compression of morbidity. So that means that you get sick towards the end of your life is when you basically become kind of like it, it, the disease process is really compressed. So you, you get sick and die at the end of your life as opposed to what a lot of Americans are experiencing that they are sick for 20 to 30 years before the end of their life. Um, and that's where the dramatic health costs are, in, uh, are um, is what's accounting for the health crisis, the health care crisis. Okay, so this is an interesting topic I want to talk about that points out the importance of how foods are epigenetic modifiers. So you'll all agree sugar 
too much processed sugar is bad, okay? We know that that's bad, that's a statistic. And of course, we all hear, eat low carbs, you shouldn't be eating carbs. I think that people should eat whole grains. I've written a couple of articles about that. There's some nice um, um, studies that show that there is improved outcomes when people eat whole grains because whole grains have these bioactive compounds that are not found in other foods. So it's really important to have that in your diet. So um, this is a study about um, blackstrap molasses. So blackstrap molasses is this has the same amount of sugar content as white sugar. So gram for gram, it has the same amount. So it has four grams per teaspoon. Um, however, what blackstrap molasses also has is all the junk that the sugar industry says. It's like, we just want the white sugar and all these uh, a big class of what's called polyphenols are in that gives it that rich flavor, that black component. There's a lot of nutrition in there. So this is an animal study where they gave um, mice, or rats maybe, I think it was a rat study. They gave them both a high fat diet. And then in one of the groups, they actually added on sugar, gave them extra sugar in the form of molasses. So you would think that group would fare poorly, right? Because you're just going to give them some extra sugar and calories. So if you, like, if you think calories in, calories out is the full explanation, this study disproves that. And so what they saw was that the group on the molasses supplement ended up having improved gene expression for a bunch of biomarkers of energy metabolism, and they lost weight. So you gave them sugar and they extra sugar and they lost weight. Now what they're not giving them is white sugar. I'd like to see that um, study done, but they didn't do that. Um, but what we saw was that they um, also had decreased levels of a um, hormone called leptin, which has to do with hormone fat uh, metabolism. Um, another great epigenetic modifier um, that there's a lot of data on is chocolate. And so chocolate also has a lot of those polyphenols in there. Um, so this was a Spanish study where, um, done in humans um, that they were given chocolate and measured when I talked about methylation status. So this is the epigenetic modification. In white blood cells, they uh, um, were able to measure a favorable pattern in this case of hypomethylation. So in white blood cells, low methylation status is an advantage. Now interestingly, people in that study who had the SNPs, the um, variation, who had genes that were um, variable for MTHFR and MTRR, which has to do with B12, they didn't have as pronounced an effect. So this is why you can start to see variation in these studies. And I would propose also, which a lot of my colleagues have, is that a lot of times when you're reading research articles and there's a lot of um, um, data that directly conflicts a previous study, you always want to think about what was the subject pool. So think about how much genetic variability, and if you've got a group of subjects that are more prone to have a particular um, genetic variant, then that might be what's skewing the study results. Um, this slide I um, think is fascinating. So it was published in the New England Journal of uh, Medicine. And while we're on the topic of chocolate, I wanted to show that. <laughs> so this is really interesting. So this is annual per capita chocolate consumption and the number of Nobel laureates per 10 million in the population. <laughs> so if you were to look at this correlation data, you would think we should just start EA up here. So, but it is really fascinating. So look at Switzerland. And then you see a bunch of these European countries that are heavy, heavier chocolate consumers. And like think like Ireland, the population of Ireland compared to the United States, and look at all these Nobel laureates. 
um, and all of these countries really, from a population, uh, uh, you know, this is, this is per uh, 10 million, but um, it's really fascinating. And then you see like China is down at the bottom. So um, yeah, a, a great uh, slide for anyone in the chocolate industry, I would say. <laughs> I, the what? Oh yeah, yes, because it's a cor it's a correlation. But it was interesting that they published that in the New England Journal of Medicine. <laughs> yes. No, they're yes, I know. Yes, so I was <laughs> exactly. Right, exactly. So that's why I was saying this would be a great slide that you can just take out of context in a, um, uh, as a chocolate manufacturer. Um, so other, I already mentioned some dietary epigenetic modifiers. Green tea, EGCG components specifically, has had a lot of study that shows uh, hyperbethylated DNA playing a role in affecting tumor suppressor genes. Um, coffee also has quite a bit of research looking at the ability to inhibit DNA methylation, so that hypomethylation pattern. And then um, turmeric also. Now this is just a short list, but these are some of the um, more widely published, um, commonly, more commonly used, obviously tea and coffee. Tea is the second most drank beverage in the world, so next to water. Um, if we think globally, tea is consumed as the second most drank beverage. Um, and then um, a lot, a tremendous amount of research on turmeric and components within turmeric, curcumin, different sorts of curcuminoids, and what effect that has on human health. So this was an article. Um, so some of the things that impact our health, again, is stress. So if we think about our stress response currently, so I, I like to use this slide because it talks about, you know, that our um, response to stress is pro-inflammatory. So if we think about how why we had this fight or flight response to begin with. So we think historically, we're trying to get away from a physical threat, a predator, <laughs> or you know, we're in the hunter as a hunter gatherer. And so we might get injured and we need inflammation to help us heal that wound. Okay, so this, this is why those immune response genes that are pro-inflammatory, it makes sense that they would get turned on. And the problem with that, though, in our current environment of not a, you know, a, here are social threats, our current stress, we, are, we don't need inflammation to help us heal from psychological stress. So that inflammation that is prolonged um, ends up lowering that host response and lowering our survival. So oxidative, these, these are two, both thought to be very much interdependent. 
So inflammatory cells will release large amounts of what are called reactive oxygen species. And it's this excess of reactive oxygen species that can initiate this cascade of signaling that leads to the genetic expression of these inflammatory mediators. So, and, and then um, we, and the reason we need those R ROS um, compounds is we need them for our immune system. Those help us kill microorganisms, it helps us with um, apoptosis, the process of, of um, cancer cells. Um, and there was this kind of, uh, I don't know, thought to be somewhat strange hypothesis from um, Watson of Watson and Crick that thought that cr uh, chronic disease was caused by failure to generate sufficient reactive oxygen species. So he was kind of like at the other end of the um, scenario. But what does chronic inflammation do? So now we start to think about all of these different chronic disease pathways. You know, what as a naturopathic doctor we see a lot of in practice. We deal mostly with chronic disease. Um, and at the core of that is inflammation. So, you, you know, this is well known. Even osteoporosis is uh, recategorized as not a deficiency state of calcium. It's more an inflammatory disorder. So then there's this um, particular compound called um, NF-kappa B. And NF-kappa B, you'll see many studies about various herbs, various different phytochemicals that impacts NF-kappa B expression. So I'm just putting that out there, that if you're reading data or you're being presented with information that is talking about something being NF-kappa B uh, suppressive or an inhibitor, um, that is important because that is kind of like the main player in inflammation is kind of how you would want to think about that. Um, hydrogen peroxide, which is something that would be a reactive oxygen species that activates NF-kappa B. And then antioxidants, so now I'm trying to get, make the link between food, antioxidants block NF-kappa B. So I feel like in the 80s and through maybe the mid-90s, antioxidants were hot stuff, and now not so much anymore. But I want to point out that antioxidants are under-recognized, I would say, and um, just the, the kind of the um, dietary pattern of most Americans would also make them very low in oxidant, uh, antioxidant compounds in terms of their intake. So um, when we think about these bioactive components that are found in um, plants, they do have broad effects. So they are direct antioxidants, so that means that they have the ability to scavenge free radicals, but they also um, act as indirect antioxidants. So this is where they're enhancing these endogenous antioxidant systems. They have the ability to upregulate enzymes, and this can happen through a variety of different mechanisms, but this is, goes back to epigenetics, that these um, uh, compounds not only act as a direct antioxidant, now, as the science is evolving more, it upregulates the ability of your DNA to produce these um, compounds that actually have an effect on um, the oxidative um, pathways. Um, this slide is pointing out some of the compounds that are involved in another pathway called NERF2. So this is the key antioxidant pathway. So if you, NF-kappa B is your inflammation pathway. And then you'll also hear about something called NERF2. And um, NERF2 is, definitely works on a um, DNA level. It's a transcription factor. 
and it activates this promoter sequence that upregulates our antioxidant defense mechanism and also impacts our detox genes. So some of the more um, commonly studied phytochemicals I've listed there, um, sulforaphane would be coming from um, like broccoli stems, resveratrol, um, grapes, um, and then even herbs like ashwagandha have that effect as well. Quercetin is a really important um, component um, found in onions, found in apples. I mean, you can get pure extracts of quercetin, but this is something found ubiquitous in nature as well. Um, obviously, it's extracted from nature and concentrated, but elderberry, this is a great time of year where people are very familiar with elderberry, hopefully. But elderberry has strong antiviral compounds in there, um, but it also contains um, quercetin. Um, the other, another main component in um, many plants are the um, phenolic content of plants. And so you'll see a number of studies showing how the, when they um, look at, uh, pull out the total amount of phenols in particular parts of plants, it has this um, direct correlation to the level of antioxidant activity, and that is thought to happen through a genetic mechanism as well. It seems to be multifactorial or, or multi-process. Um, um, but red leaf from Swiss chard has a higher level of these, and I'm not dissing any parts of the plant, just <laughs> let me know, because I'm just talking directly about the antioxidant activity. So very high in the red leaf um, component. White leaves a little less. This is just for, for phenols that can scavenge free radicals. And then the stems increasingly lower. Sorry, what's that? You don't get, no. Don't eat the stems? No. No, I'm saying eat, eat the whole plant. Because it, it, the whole, the plant, and I'm going to talk about synergy, is that whole plants, this is the beauty of nature, is there's so many different compounds in there balancing out what um, one particular compound is doing and working together in synergy, that when you just start pulling out just individual elements and concentrating it, um, it changes the biochemical effect of a plant. And this is true, traditional herbalists have known this for many years, that they might standardize their extracts a little bit, but there's such a, a broad base of knowledge about synergy of plants and which herbs to mix together to get synergistic effects. Um, this is just a slide about all the different types of diseases that there are what we find com what are called comorbidity patterns between various different types of inflammatory disorders, which is why we see like groups of diseases coming together. And like in our practice, we rarely see someone presenting for just one condition. Like our list of health complaints, people don't come to us rarely because they just want to be healthy. Unfortunately, we see people, because most people are like, well, I'm fine, I'm healthy. People who are coming to us are sick. They have a lot of different diseases and it is a, quite a challenge to um, get them back to a good state of health. But we do that through integrative um, medicine. Are the, like, all the veggies closer to each other? All the greens closer to each other? Yeah, so depending on the different color, those are those sets that it's probably, this slide is not showing up great for colors. But basically, it's like a set. So the purple, like you can see the purples going together. So we know. Like there are links between periodontal disease and heart disease, for example. Like the, that there are common comorbidities that can present. So it's not in your book? No. But I think we're, the slides are going to be, are they going to be available? Yeah. Yes. Yes, I think so. Yes. Yep. Oops. There's a line that goes from Alzheimer's to, you know, depression, for instance, that those are connected, but they're not the same color. So what you're saying is that words are the same 
Well, there's a lot, there's complexity in there. So the colors do link up, but they also, um, there are some that link to each other. So there are some that are like a triad, and some are just like not a triad. That was published in Discovery Medicine, though, in 2017. So there's a whole article written about that. Okay, so let me see how we're doing on time. Okay, so bioactives and human health. So another class of compounds that there's quite a bit of data on is anthocyanins. And so these are flavonoids that are um, found in a lot of different plants, but particularly um, very concentrated in dark berries. So um, blueberries in particular are a great source of anthocyanins. And they have the ability to not only work on antioxidant system, they also work on inflammatory signaling as well. And flavonoids, we know, have been shown to impact um, what we call executive function pathways. And so there was actually, a, a st I'm going to go over another study, but this particular one I'm pointing out was about blueberry intake and mood in children and young adults. And so blueberries can actually help to decrease processes like rumination, where you can't let go of something, like something negative that you continue to ruminate about, um, but also just improving positive affect. So that was a 2017 study published in Nutrients. Um, and then this particular study was published in 2016 in the European Journal of Nutrition, and this was a relatively small study, a double-blind crossover study. And this is the thing about many of the plant studies. They're, they are small, because who's going to fund blueberries? Maybe, you know, like there's not a lot of money um, going into it. So this is the challenge of finding these studies. Um, so 21 children, age 7 to 10, who either consumed um, a placebo or they had a blueberry drink. Basically, it was a freeze-dried wild blueberry powder. So we know wild berries have a lot more concentrated phytonutrient in there, um, 15 or 30 gram servings. And so what happened in this study is they gave them the drinks in the morning, and then they started measuring cognitive performance. So they actually did testing in uh, that morning. And the kids on the blueberry powder, and it was an, the increasing dose, actually they even had higher scores, had improved word recognition, verbal memory. Um, their responses were better. So just think about the power of nutrition in our children. So what you eat for breakfast does matter. So I make a, like a whole food smoothie for my kids in the morning because of data like this. I mean, I was doing it before that, but this just highlights the importance of nutrition in the morning. So when you're feeding your kids brain nutrients, full body nutrition, how they score on a test even that morning can be altered by what they just had for breakfast. Um, and then what is very sad, as I already presented data about the vegetable deficiency among children, especially in the United States, is 85% of children don't get those essential nutrients for optimal brain development. So now we're talking about things like choline, omega-3s, um, minerals and vitamins. Yes? No, so there's still, so the amount of recovery, I guess, is what is not known. So we know that making changes in nutrition will make a difference, um, but we don't know if they can recover their entire potential at that point. But we know there are very critical phases in development, like that phase of like young childhood, like prenatally is a very critical phase, but young childhood, that period of time, like six to 10, is very critical for um, health outcomes. And you can even see studies that link that to incidents of things like, so you, you don't even, even with the trauma, 
it's not just anxiety, depression, mood disorders that they can be at a higher risk of later in life. It's things like heart disease and diabetes, what's consuming our um, healthcare budgets, that, that, that those are the risk factors. Um, not just cognitive health. But yeah, the, I guess the answer is we, we don't know how much can be recovered, but we do like clinically see differences in function and measures of you know, the, the data coming in when we put someone on better nutrition. Like you can see that right away. Yeah. Oh, when I just said trauma, I was talking about when I was talking about um, a tra um, psychological trauma that is heritable that was passed down, but also just like trauma in childhood, like that you've actually had it in your lifetime, not talking about previous generations. Yes, that does impact health outcomes like in your 40s. Yeah, so that, you, you know, if it's physical, sexual trauma as a child, it impacts things like heart disease. And so yeah, so but I didn't mean tr I wasn't saying trauma about dietary, but yes, for sure, diet in childhood does affect health outcomes. And that can be passed. That's epigenetics, so that can be passed on. Yes. Yeah. Um, here's another study about, as I said, it's really important what kids are eating early in life, and so this was um, a study looking at kids who ate per home prepared vegetables and fruits uh, between the ages of six and 12 months. So this is the time where you know, you're transitioning babies from breastfed or formula onto solids. Then what are they eating? It, unfortunately, there are kids eating french fries as their first food when they're six months old. And this is the reality of our country and what's happening. Um, but this particular study looked at kids who were fed vegetables and fruits that were home prepared, um, and they had a higher IQ at four years of age. So now you also have to consider, this is the thing about these studies, you have to consider what the parents are also doing. So now you have like socioeconomic um, data that influences that. Um, you have just like um, child care, right? That, that whole um, nature nurture going on that the parents are doing this. Um, but you know, I see patients of lower socioeconomic status who like feed their children good food, right? Like, so you can't just make that case, but unfortunately, the, you know, there are, those associations are there. Um, and so this is what I, I would also point out is like, okay, there's nutrition, but we also know that babies who are held more have their impacts on their genetics that last for years. Um, and you're starting to see this more and more in the media, which is why I pulled that slide up, um, that, um, we even from there are data from um, babies in orphanages in Russia and the size of their brains later in life that they actually have measurable changes in brain uh, volume because they were not like held as babies. Well, the assumption is holding, uh, but there could be other factors as well, nutrition. Um, so again, just pointing out that early stress, life stress changes the way our genes function. Okay, so a little bit about bioactive synergy. I think I definitely have prepared way too many slides, but <laughs> we won't get to the end of this. But so plant synergy. So traditional concept of uh, plant synergy is just that the combined parts, so if you're not familiar with this, it means that if you took two plants or herbs and measure the a particular effect on some uh, process, a biochemical process, um, that when you add the two together, you don't just get an additive effect. So say something, there was a rise by like five points for each of those, it wouldn't just be 10. The concept of synergy is you combine those together and now you get a rise of like 15. Um, 
And so this is that beauty of that whole plant and, and all of its beautiful complexity, why those compounds are there. You're hearing a lot about in um, all many circles about endocannabinoids, hemp oil, some of the compounds that um, the phytocannabinoids that impact our endocannabinoids um, um, receptors, and I'm definitely not an expert in this area, so don't ask me a lot of questions about it. <laughs> but um, uh, we know that other plants have the ability to bind those receptors too, like carrots, for example, can bind endocannabinoid receptors. So this is not just this one unique plant. Um, that like is doing something that no other plant is doing. It has higher levels of some of those compounds, but this is kind of trickles through our the plant um, um, kingdom. And then, as I said, the um, particular components. So you'll see a lot of studies where they pull out components. So when you see studies about green tea, a lot of times they're pulling out EGCG. But it also, when you drink, like most people, I mean, even unless you're taking a supplement, you're drinking green tea, you're drinking that whole plant. And so you will see studies also about green tea drinkers and various different um, health outcomes. Um, and, but the colors of the plants meet, can often um, show higher levels of particular compounds, like red is associated with lycopene, um, whites, a lot of times there's a lot of quercetin and allicin that you would find in things like the onion family. Um, when we think about lycopene, there's also studies, uh, I don't have a slide on it, but studies about lycopene and prostate health. And there, um, there was, I think it was in the 1970s, there was a company who was going to like have this particular lycopene extract and they were, they couldn't reproduce the data. It was because they, it was the whole plant. It was the, using something like to, uh, the whole tomato is what made the difference, not just lycopene alone. So the reprodu reproducibility of the data didn't allow that company to <coughs> produce the, the product that they planned to produce. Um, the other thing that's important, and this is an extension of plant synergy, is the concept of diversity. So having, when a, 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 and I know um, that there was a talk about the microbiome, so I'm not going to talk a lot about that today, but it, in particular with the microbiome, having a lot of plant diversity in your diet has been shown to be associated with a healthier microbiome. Um, the, um, so this is, I know, you know, the challenge in a lot of the population is just getting them to eat vegetables. So now when you throw on top of that, you should eat some diversity as well. <laughs> it gets tricky. Uh, but for those of you who are out there eating plenty of fruits and vegetables and you're looking to optimize your nutritional status, it appears that you're better off, so if you were to get, like, eat two cups of broccoli, you would be better off eating a cup and a half of four different types of greens than, you know, a little bit more. So you could eat a little less quantity, but if you have a diverse group, so think of, like, the concept of a green salad. So you just have romaine lettuce on that green salad versus you have, like, five different greens, and you get some fresh herbs from your garden and throw those in there too. Now you've got a beautiful plant soup that <laughs> speaks to your DNA. So I even talk to patients about like if they're trying to get more diversity, some of these simple things like start adding herbs and spices to a lot of your meals. Like that alone is going to enhance the phytonutrient intake that you're going to end up um, in, with in your regular diet. <laughs> Um, and so these plants are affecting not only our human genome, but also the genes of our microbiome, the bacteria it, that lives with us. Um, this is another slide pointing out that um, importance of plant synergy. And so a whole, this is a, based on a whole buckwheat extract that the antioxidant activity uh, rutin is a compound that is often attributed to um, the high level of antioxidant activity in buckwheat. 
And I think buckwheat is one of those plants. I don't know if anyone is growing buckwheat, but it's one of those superfoods that a lot of people don't recognize so much. Uh, but there's so many um, great you know, compounds in there. But the concept of the whole extract. So if you start to look at this particular um, slide here, pure rutin is the lighter colored burr and then the whole extract. So this is increasing concentration of rutin compared to the whole extract against the antioxidant activity. And so right here you can see, like if you were doing concentrated rutin, the whole extract is outperforming it here, here. Um, it's not until up here. You'd have to give tons and tons of rutin before that whole extract would outperform it. Yeah, meaning like eating the whole plant. So this was done in you know a, a, a dish, basically, like in a study um, where it was um, in vitro, so not in a person. And um, it, the the point of this is yes, like emphasizing eat whole foods. No, it's just this is that would be more so the grout that was. Yeah, because this is just pulling out one component of it, just the rootin. Because all I have is the grout, and she has the whole. Well, so the whole, so the whole plant would be even better, <laughs> as we know. Like, in the in the leaves. Okay, I don't know the answer to that. Does anyone else know? But the whole plant buckwheat? The topic of lectins. Mm -hmm. Maybe you'll touch on that. Yeah, I don't have anything in here about lectins, um, but that's certainly a controversial topic. Um, there was a conference where um, <coughs> Fasano, I don't know if anyone knows him, so he and Gundry had a <laughs> controversial exchange on the topic of tomatoes, and um, Gundry had some study that was done on tomatoes from this particular village in Italy, and Fasano was like, "That I grew, I'm from that village, <laughs> and we eat tomatoes, <laughs> and what you're saying is complete nonsense." So it was like it was a very heated exchange. Um, but my take on it is not restricting more foods. <laughs> I don't think that that's why people are sick, because most people are not eating enough plants. It, right, and it's certainly like preparation can make a difference. So like we know, you know, like with um, beans, the way that they're cooked, with legumes, how they're prepared, that can vary, and commercial preparations can vary. Uh, but if people are eating canned beans, a lot of those are pressure cooked. So that would take out the lectins. Not everything is, but some of the better manufacturers, like Eden, I, my understanding is that the lectins are taken out. Well, so I, I mean, they're pre pressure cooked, and they're. The, the wide use of white rice boosts the, the hull and everything on the rice grain, which is the lectins. Right. Yep. Yep. <laughs> No, that was in an in vitro study, just to show the difference between, again, about plant synergy. They got a whole plant, you got one component that is billed as the antioxidant in there, but you use the whole plant, which wouldn't have that much rootin in it, and it outperforms it. That's the takeaway. Um, and then there are a lot of other plants that have been studied, per tremendous amount of um, data on this about combining various different together and just about the whole plant. So broccoli and tomato eaten together are more potent. This is this concept of food combining. I know there are a lot of um, um, health experts who have written quite extensively on food combining. Um, but like the combination of broccoli and Brussels sprouts together can upregulate the enzyme systems that um, have to do with phase two detoxification more effectively. Okay, and then I do want to get, because I know we only have 15 minutes left, I'm going to have questions. I do just want to get quickly to the concept of microRNAs. So microRNAs are the new um, 
um, topic that is really um, exploding within um, the scientific community. A lot of it, though, is driven by pharmaceutical innovation, I will say. Um, but we're learning a lot about microRNAs from foods as well. But the race now is big pharma getting to <laughs> have some biotech um, modifications to manipulate microRNA. So my, what we're looking at, though, is nutramyromics. So we talked about epigenetics, genomics. Now there's nutramyromics. And that's the study of the influence of diet on modifying gene expression due, it, due to um, um, modification changes in microRNA. So microRNA, um, I don't know if anyone is familiar with Jeff Bland. Have you ever, anyone familiar with Jeff Bland? A couple of you. So he is um, a thought leader in, um, in functional nutrition, functional medicine. And years ago, he was talking about this black box DNA, like all this junk, and there's something in it. And so it turns out, and he, would, you know, we didn't know what it was at the time, but it turns out that stuff is microRNA. And these microRNAs are non-coding RNA molecules that um, have an effect when um, DNA is getting transcribed, and so it basically silences certain things. So it'll turn off things that you don't want turned on. Um, and it is controlled also by specific nutrients in our environment, in, in our diet, but it's also another one of those instances where stress actually can, can control um, how microRNA is upregulated in your body. Um, I want to get to the next slide. So some of the bioactives impacting endogenous microRNA expression, some of the big ones that are being studied are, again, some of these compounds that we have seen in other instances, but I think now we're getting even a better understanding of their profound impact, and that's in microRNA expression. So this is upregulating our microRNAs. Um, vitamins and minerals have the ability to do that as well. And then these are some of the pathways that are being described. So now you see some of these compounds that I have talked about all, uh, already, like NERF2, which has to do with the antioxidant pathway, TNF-alpha, which is involved in inflammation, the cyclooxygenase pathways, which again are involved in inf inflammation. When you look at these studies, now they're identifying specific microRNAs. The other thing, so really what I wanted to get to, is microRNAs are also found in our food. So what we're consuming, what plants are also giving to us, not only is it just phytochemicals, they contain microRNAs. These microRNAs survive digestion in the stomach, so they're found into the intestine, and various plants, and so they're found in plants, but they're also found in animal sources as well. They have differing levels of bioavailability. So this is, you know, this is an area that is continuing to, you know, more and more papers being studied on this area, and not a lot. There's a, a general knowledge base, but there's a lot more to learn here. <laughs> But the question is, if it's staying in the intestine, not getting into the bloodstream, just like some other compounds, like the curcuminoids in um, turmeric, when that stays in the gut, um, and even compounds in chocolate, has an effect on the microbiome also. So there's um, increasing absorption of some of these compounds might not necessarily equate to a better biological effect, that some of this happens in the gut anyway. So then this is a question that would be extended to microRNA. If some of it doesn't get into measurable levels into the bloodstream, certain ones do. Depending on the type of microRNA, it may have different mechanisms of action working on the human genome versus on your uh, microbiome. And then this is just a summary slide um, looking at microRNAs that are identified that work with different, that have been identified in specific different pathways and even disease states like Parkinson's disease. And this is where you'll see 
pharmaceutical innovation, unfortunately, trying to manipulate, or, or fortunately, possibly, trying to manipulate um, um, disease processes. Um, and then, of course, um, food, our food contains vitamins. Um, that it, not only do they contain actual vitamins, they contain compounds that influence our absorption of other vitamins. And um, when we think about genomic testing, we do look at vitamin metabolism as well there. Um, okay. So, oh, this is a study about choline, which is found in a lot of different food sources. So choline um, is um, found in dark leafy greens, found in eggs and liver in higher levels. Mushrooms are also a really good source of cho choline. But choline is um, very much involved in um, DNA methylation and gene expression. So again, back to some of the reasons why prenatal nutrition um, matters. Um, women in their third trimester who were given choline supplements. So we also, this is just easy, obviously they do supplementation because it's easier to study. Um, they, their um, infants were then tested for various co cognitive processing so scores and they had base measurements that correlate with higher IQ levels um, at those particular time uh, points in terms of their months of age, like after birth. Um, higher, the takeaway was higher intake of choline improved those scores. Okay, and I'm going to end with magnesium. So this is probably a big topic for you guys in your community, um, but more than 50% of the population has a suboptimal dietary intake of magnesium, and um, this is a you know this is something we talk about in our community to our patients that people come in and they're like, well, I'm eating such and such. How could I have a magnesium deficiency? We're like, well, the soil is depleted. So we have this, just so you know, we are having these talks with patients about soil quality and this is why they may, and, and this harkens back to the slide about vegetable deficiency. We also have the problem of people eating what seems like enough fruits and vegetables, but they're still deficient in various, like that they have measurable um, test results that show deficiency, um, yet they should not be deficient. Um, so yes, yeah, so soil quality um, is a big issue there. So um, even like old data back from pre and post 1968, there was a 20% drop in magnesium content in wheat. Um, and that has also been observed for various other minerals, um, like iron, iodine, zinc, um, and vitamin A. Um, I just want to get to magnesium. Sorry, I'm going fast because we're running out of time. So some of the things we think about with low magnesium, these are some of the symptoms, mild headaches, brain fog, muscle twitches, um, muscle weakness, just fatigue, like oh, we get so many patients just coming in with um, a chief complaint of fatigue and we always look at their magnesium levels because we know that can be a potential sign of low magnesium. Um, Magnesium is also something we consider in patients who are coming in with anxiety disorder as well or irritability. And we know that magnesium affects the um, calcium channels as well. And this is really the slide that I wanted to get to that I thought would be um, really important to see. So we think about magnesium there are in, you know, in the supplement industry, there's a lot of discussion about what form of magnesium you're taking. Are you taking magnesium glycinate or magnesium oxide or um, citrate? There was a, so this slide um, is looking at how high magnesium levels get in the cerebrospinal fluid. This was an animal study. Um, following the administration of various forms of magnesium. So the um, levels we see here, so placebo, you know, didn't really do anything. Mag citrate, you're, you're seeing a baseline. 
mag bisglycinate, you see a little bit of a rise. Then there's mag 3 and 8, which is also um, called magtine. And that was billed as getting in past the blood-brain barrier. And this is the form to use if you're trying to treat uh, mood disorders, um, you know, anything that is in the mental health, emo emotional, neurological realm using MAG3 and A. But this is a pretty recent, recent data um, from a, a company that is using a plant-based magnesium. And look at that plant-based magnesium. It's up here. And it's... Um, an extract of buckwheat and Swiss chard. Who makes that? Standard process. Standard process. It's a company in um, Wisconsin, and they uh, that would be a great um, group, I think, to team up with because <laughs> they one of the cores they have their own. So this is a supplement company that has their own organic farms, and they have tons of data on soil quality, and they talk about the microbiome. Um, they talk about like soil quality and why their whole foods-based supplements make such a difference. So now this is their magnesium um, supplement that is just plant-based very, you know, not a really high dose of magnesium salts in there, and it gets into our plus the blood-brain barrier better than anything else. Okay, the question was about magnesium um, using Epsom salts um, as skin absorption for magnesium. So I don't, like, I, I think there are people who are really sensitive to magnesium, and sometimes we use magnesium um, Epsom salt baths for them, but I don't think much of it necessarily gets absorbed. Like, it certainly wouldn't get absorbed into CSF from, I, I can't imagine it would get into CSF from bathing in it, because you'd have to have a driver. Yeah, so then, the, so the question was about transdermal magnesium preparations. So then that's kind of different because in a transdermal preparation, typically those preparations will have some sort of driver. And so it will, it's usually not just like magnesium mixed with, you know, some sort of like <laughs> coconut oil or something like that. It's going to have other compounds in there, just like any transdermal cream or gel, it has to have something that kind of like opens up the skin to enhance absorption. So depending on what transdermal preparation it is, it would have other ingredients. But yes, so then in that case, it's just like transdermal hormones. It do, those do get in for sure. Yeah. 